and gentlemen to another video. Today I wanted to look at the 10 biggest value decreases of the offseason. It is fantasy football prep time and I want to get you guys as ready as possible. So we're starting in early June. There has been so much movement that brings not only good but also bad shifts for some players and this list includes 15 who saw their stocks plummet for one reason or another in the off season. I'm going to also cover five honorable mentions before I start at 10 and work my way to the guy who I feel had the most misfortune with his team and his surroundings heading into 2020. Now before I get into all of that, if you are new to the channel, if you haven't done it yet, or if you've enjoyed content from me in the past, please consider giving me a like and a subscribe. It helps me so much and I greatly appreciate all of the support to my current subscribers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I could not do it without you. With that done, let's get into this version of Hot Off The Press. My first honorable mention is Mac Jones, and I just have one question for you, New England. Do you guys want to score any points in 2022? Arguably, the biggest need that the Patriots had was finding someone for Jones to throw the ball to. So what do they do? They end up giving up a third, they get a fifth back for Devontae Parker, a receiver with one 800 yard season in seven tries. Now two starting offensive linemen also left, if that was not bad enough, ouch. New England was my worst offseason team for a reason, and when your team is crumbling around you and you get no offensive support either, it is a big value drop. To Atlanta next, and I'm talking about core Daryl Patterson, and things were roses for Patterson after his new deal. And then it all basically started to unravel. Matt Ryan left after the Deshaun Watson failed pursuit, welcoming a massive quarterback downgrade to Marcus Mariota. Then the Falcons go and sign Damian Williams to compete with him for touches, and they drafted a rookie running back as the cherry on top. All of a sudden, the running back group is fairly crowded and the offense, which already struggled plenty, is even worse. Tack on the lack of Calvin Ridley's return and even with that Drake London addition, Atlanta and their playmakers are going nowhere fast. To Chicago next and it's Justin Fields and similar to the New England situation, the Bears seem determined to mess up their young quarterback's chances at taking any kind of step forward. After letting Allen Robinson go in free agency, along with three other wideouts from 2021, Chicago signed a bunch of never worse and then gave Byron Pringle $4 million. Their game plan seems to hinge on Darnell Mooney becoming a top 15 wideout and carrying the passing game. And although I really like Mooney, he's not ready to make that type of leap just yet. Fields is gonna have few options to utilize while learning a completely new system. He is fighting an uphill battle to say the least. Robert Woods is up next. The movement to one of the most run-heavy offenses in the league is not a good start. And while I do think that the A.J. Brown movement helps him, I still do not love this landing spot. Ryan Tannehill is a definite downgrade and Traylon Burks was drafted to replace Brown. Woods will not just have his injury to battle back from to remain a relevant fantasy option this season. To Buffalo before we get to my top 10 and it is Devin Singletary I am looking at. For whatever reason, the Bills never seemed to feel comfortable giving the lead back role to Singletary in 2021. It doesn't seem like things are gonna change much in 2022. With solid draft capital being spent on running back James Cook, that's in the second round, Buffalo looks likely to resort to a committee approach once again. Josh Allen is of course still gonna get his touches on the ground, so I am hesitant to invest too much on Singletary this year. Starting at number 10, it is Ryan Tannehill, and this comes down to the swap at wide receiver that Tannehill saw in the offseason. Gaining Traylon Burks and Robert Woods does not make up for the Julio Jones, A.J. Brown losses, not even close. 
even with Jones having a subpar at best 2021, losing AJ Brown is scary for this Titans passing attack. He was guaranteed to win one-on-one -on -one matchups and could help dictate a defense. Without that, Tannehill could certainly struggle, especially if it takes Woods time to get back to 100% after that ACL injury. And or the NFL game is too much for Traylon Burks to handle early on. I was not a huge fan of Tannehill prior to this movement and I am backing way off of him now. I just do not see a lot of upside from a team that is already so committed to the ground game. At number 9 it is Hunter Renfro and I suppose the Devontae Adams trade can be looked at a few ways but for pure fantasy value it is a net negative for Renfro. Prior to the trade, Hunter was the unquestioned number one with a clear path to 125 plus targets. Adam's addition means a significant slice of the pie is going elsewhere. No one has seen a higher target share over the last two seasons. Renfro's game may actually become more efficient with better matchups, but the volume is going to decrease significantly from what it could have been. He may struggle to reach the top 25 at the position as a result. At 8, it is Clyde Edwards Elaire. The Tyreek Hill trade is going to have far reaching effects, and this is part of that. It is not just the passing game that will suffer for the Chiefs. It means an easier time for the defense and a better ability for them to be able to load up against the running game. Kansas City also went out and got veteran insurance in Ronald Jones II from Tampa Bay. Both Mike Remmers and Austin Blythe, starters on that offensive line, are also gone up front, which means tougher sledding and less opportunities in a worse overall offense for CEH. In at seven, it is Antonio Gibson, and the offseason could have went a few ways for Gibson, but unfortunately it went sideways for him very quickly. Not only did the commanders go out and re-sign JD McKissick, but they also drafted Brian Robinson Jr. to compete for touches in what is now a crowded backfield. If that was it, maybe Gibson is not on the list. Except that Washington also went and gave a arm and a leg to trade for Carson Wentz. So not great. The Commanders also lost both starting guards from 2021 in Eric Flowers and Brandon Scherf. There is lots of backpedaling here for Washington and that puts Gibson in a far inferior situation this coming year. I have Chase Edmonds as my sixth ranked player and though he struggled with injuries in 2021, Edmonds had a good thing going in Arizona. He complimented James Conner really well and he got to play in an excellent offensive system. His role was defined. That will change with his arrival to Miami. While I actually really like this Dolphins offense, after all the moves that they made to improve, who exactly is going to get touches in the backfield is beyond a mystery. After the Finns had a new lead back on a weekly basis last season, there is a really good chance that that trend continues in 2022. Miami signed basically any running back with a pulse once the offseason started, bringing in Sony Michel and Raheem Mostert, in addition to already having Salvin Ahmed on the roster. Now somebody here is going to step up but who and which week is going to be really hard to figure out. It is a committee monster of doom that I do not want any part of. Staying at the beach for number five, it is Tyreek Hill. And while he was right to choose Miami over New York, either way, the landing spot was going to be worse for him than in his previous digs. I am a Tua Tagovailoa supporter, but he is not on the same wavelength as Patrick Mahomes. The offense surrounding him is not on the same level in Miami, and there is no genius scheming up the right play call to help open up the field. Hill is also going to have to compete with Jalen Waddle for targets. And though Tyreek is going to be that number one option for the Dolphins, do not underestimate the connection that Waddle and Tua already have. It may take time for Hill and Tua to build that type of trust and rapport. And Waddle was a top 20 receiver according to PFF in his own right. They are going to cannibalize each other to some degree and Tyreek could find himself outside the top 10 in 2022. In at four, it is Michael Carter who had issues staying healthy last season. So I cannot fault the Jets too much for drafting another running back. I will say though, it is pretty damning that after just one year in the system, New York is already ready to look elsewhere. 
I love the kid, so hopefully he can change that narrative quickly. But the Brees Hall pick basically means that Carter is likely relegated to a complementary role. And prior to it, there was a shot that he was going to be a full-blown workhorse. And at worst, maybe a 1A with a bunch of 1Bs stealing carries here and there. No more. This is a massive step down for his 2022 prospects. The offense is going to be better, but Carter will not be a part of it nearly as much. Rashad Penny is next at three, and just when you thought that Rashad Penny had broken free of his first round bust label and carved out a significant role for himself, it all burned down real quick. Penny goes from a solid offensive structure around him to one in total shambles. Russell Wilson is gone, and he's replaced by Drew Locke, which is not a good start. The Seahawks made it worse in April, taking Kenneth Walker the third in the second round. Double ouch. You don't spend that type of draft capital for the new kid to ride the pine. Walker is gonna see work, and he was the number two prospect at the position for most. Already competing with Chris Carson, should he be healthy and ready to go, of course, this backfield just got a whole lot murkier. In an offense that I already did not want a ton to do with, I am full on backing out on the Seahawks running back committee. At number two, it is Aaron Rodgers. And I'm gonna ride the Rodgers hate until he makes me stop, okay? Rodgers took all of the money and then he lost the game's best receiver in the process. Right tackle Billy Turner and left guard Lucas Patrick also left town, leaving a gaping hole in the offensive line. If that was not enough, the Packers yet again passed on a first round talent at wideout. They took Christian Watson early in the second. He was the seventh wide receiver drafted. With Marquez Valdez-Scantling also gone, it leaves the pack with a thin cupboard. Unless Sammy Watkins or Randall Cobb both take leaps or Watson explodes early on, Green Bay is going to rely heavily on their ground attack and defense to win games. Rodgers could struggle to remain a top 10 option next year. The good news though is that if he gets another MVP this year, at least he will actually have earned it. We finally get to my number one biggest losers of the offseason, and you may have guessed it after seeing Rashad Penny at number three. This is a two for one special, and it was a layup to finish off my rankings. Even though I feel like I don't have to explain it, it's DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. In case you missed it, Russell Wilson is no longer in Seattle, and I haven't seen that much good from Drew Locke over his first three seasons. With a career record of 8-13 and, and an average of under 200 passing yards per game to this point, I am pretty sure that no one else has either. But hey, at least he's thrown more touchdowns than picks. Seattle also lost both tackles from 2021, so an already questionable offensive line is in even more flux. With that, I just do not see a productive path forward for Metcalf or for Lockett. I believe that the Seahawks offense struggles as a whole and scoring opportunities basically vanish. And with a massive quarterback downgrade, their efficiency also plummets. There is no way that they produce anywhere near their career averages and no one saw their situation decrease more in the off season. And that is all I have for you guys for today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed the content and I hope you learned something. If you guys are brand new to the channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please consider giving me a like and a subscribe. The support I get helps me out so very much and I cannot thank you guys enough. This is Relentless Press. I am your host, Abraham Opatz, and we will see you next time.